Hi, Bio30. Uh, I'm going to finish up our um, series of ecology lectures today. Um, slides go from 66 to 85. Shouldn't be too long um, a lesson today. Uh, most of this is review. There's a couple new concepts, um, but it's pretty straightforward. Math's done with ecology. So again, I want you to think about applying these themes to um, your poaching assignment um, as I go through these concepts. So just a quick reminder when we look at competition. Um, competition is a struggle between organisms for limited resources and we have two main types of competition. Um, intra, um, which is a struggle for limited resources amongst the same species. Generally that's territorial or competition for mates. Um, you can see here light competition with trees and a canopy. Um, you can think about um, a rutting season where males compete for multiple females, things like that. Um, intra is within species competition. Always density dependent based on population. Um, Interspecific is a struggle between members of different species for limited resources. And ultimately what happens is resource partitioning from that. So if you remember Gauss's principle from Bio 20, where no two species can exist in the same niche in an environment indefinitely, or one loses out. Um, so this is where we get ultimately evolution happening and um, different behavioral patterns for a species arising in order to avoid competition. Um, I'll give you another example here with white spruce and lodgepole pine. Pine tend to be able to handle drier conditions, white spruce and boggy, muddy, more anoxic conditions. Um, but they have the same sort of life history strategies, right? They're coniferous trees and they photosynthesize year round, um, things like that, right? So those are your two main types of competition. You need to understand that interaction. And there are multiple questions in your key that relate to these types of relationships. So the ultimate form of interspecific competition is um, coevolution between predator prey. Here's a little African proverb for you in my notes that um, sort of kind of helps lay this out. There's always a struggle for survival and there's always um, a genetic change happening for these organisms to get a one-up on each other through mutation. Think about antibiotic resistance. Um, that's a really good example of um, uh, a coevolution of our modern medicine trying to sort of get a one-up on antibiotics and the more that we pressure them to eradicate them, the quicker they evolve. And that's why, um, you know, antibiotic resistance is such a big problem because we've overused antibiotics um, since their development at the start of the 20th century, right? Penicillin effectively doesn't work anymore. So I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about these population pyramids, but you know that in an environment from bio 20, right, that energy always moves up a food web. You lose 90% of the energy due to consumption and loss as heat. So basic thermodynamics makes us lose energy. Um, only 10% of the energy from a lower trophic level gets transferred to the next level. That's why you can't have the same amount of organisms at each level of consumption because there's significantly less and less energy as we move up a food chain. Right, so your producers have the most solar energy and then that energy is transferred to the, um, to the primary consumers and then primary consumers are eaten by predators. And then you have your charismatic apex predators at the top of food chains, your tertiary and, and quaternary consumers. And um, right, they essentially have the pick of the litter of what they consume um, in an environment. But that's the rule of 10, right? Where um, only 10% of the energy from a lower trophic level is transferred to the next level. And population numbers are reflective of that rule of 10 as well, right? So if I have a million blades of grass, I'll only have 100,000 grasshoppers, right? And then anything that's consuming a grasshopper, there'll only be 10% of those numbers at the next level, right? So there would be, you know, 10,000 snakes, for example. And then, you know, maybe 1,000 owls, and then above that, something eating an owl. Um, 
which would be, you know, the human or something that is a more dominant predator. The, you know, there'd only be 10% of that of those 1,000 owls, so maybe 100 of them, um, so on and so forth, right? So just keep that in mind. Um, energy never goes down the food chain. It always moves up the food chain. And then the matter gets brought back to the beginning with decomposition. Um, this is a predator-prey cycle, so... Um, again, this is in your slides. So the Hudson's Bay Company has done a really good job um, mapping pelts basically throughout its entire history. Um, it's interesting that some of the best ecological information that we have is from a, you know, a, a colonial fur trading corporation. Um, but they still keep tabs with their biologists on snowshoe hare and Canadian lynx populations. Um, and you can see that there's a, there's, um, a cyclical relationship between these animals. So lynx are highly specialized for consuming snowshoe hares and snowshoe hares are highly adapted to avoid lynx. So lynx basically exclusively consume snowshoe hares. Um, so that's a big thing that you should understand. So if the snowshoe hare populations collapse in this country, then lynx is done. Um, so you can see that. Um, you know, as snowshoe hare populations rise, then after a lag, the lynx populations increase as well. But as the predator relationship climaxes, then the prey populations collapse. And that should make sense because the lynx are eating a lot of prey. There's always more prey than predator. And the predator populations always mirror the prey populations after a lag, right? Because you have to have the food source there in order for the predators to be able to survive. So they follow this cyclical pattern. So this is a co-evolution between the two. So there's huge pressure between these two species to, um, to adapt to each other. Um, so that's co-evolution. So if we, lo if, we, if we look at some of these relationships with predators, um, the first one that I mentioned with the lynx and the snowshoe hare, this is an example of the red queen hypothesis. So it's, you know, it, it you know, takes a little creative liberty from Alice in Wonderland with the Red Queen because she says to Alice, you have to do a lot of running to stay in the same place. Um, so predator and prey are in an evolutionary arms race. Um, so a, every generation there's selection for adaptive traits to be able to either evade predators or catch prey. Um, so if you think about, you know, the Hardy-Weinberg principles that um, cause genetic equilibrium to not be met. You can think of that massive amount of natural selection that's going on in those populations in order to um, constantly evade the predator or be able to catch the prey. So there's always baseline change um, in order to be able to get a one up on the other and it never really stops. Okay, so that's the Red Queen hypothesis. Um, cryptism is something that's universal in the animal kingdom. Um, it's interesting that black, yellow, and red are actually colors that have evolved through natural selection to universally um, signify that an organism is harmful. And it, this spans across all continents and um, spans across the entire animal kingdom. All organisms uniformly recognize these animals to be harmless. So animals that have this cryptic coloration, um, they're generally warnings and they're likely to be poisonous or have some sort of virulent properties that animals should avoid. So that's a coral snake. Um, and you can see that. It's very, very poisonous. So a little, it's, if, you're, if you're ever on the coast of California, you'll, you'll see, um, you, might be, you might see these animals, but you'll also see another animal that looks very similar to it. So this is a scarlet king snake here, and that's a coral snake. So this cryptic coloration is universal in the animal kingdom, but some animals have taken advantage of this. So you can see that this scarlet king snake is, it's actually a constrictor, it's not poisonous, and it's actually evolved to have the same coloration pattern roughly as the eastern coral snake. Um, so we have non-virulent animals that don't have poisonous properties or they're not harmful in the way that, you know, one of these really dangerous poisonous animals or they have some other type of, um, you know, protective behavior um, with a warning sign. 
There's a lot of animals that mimic that. So this is called mimicry. So this is Batesian mimicry, where one animal that's not harmful or, or, or doesn't have that harmful property actually evolves to look like an animal that does. Okay. Um, so there's a little um, saying that you can, so if, you ever, if you're ever on the coast of California, you might see both of these animals together. Um, king snakes eat small rodents and things like that. So if you have um, uh, red with yellow, so you can see those red with yellow stripes. Red with yellow means you're a dead fellow. And then um, red with black means you're all right, Jack. Um, so this, this indicates non-venomous, and this is the animal that's mimicking the animal that is venomous. Okay, so that's called mimicry. There's another type of mimicry called malarian mimicry. And you may have recognized these. They both look like monarch butterflies, but one's actually a tiger butterfly and one's a monarch. So this is a tiger butterfly, and that's a monarch butterfly. Now, cool thing about monarchs is all of them... They overwinter and they breed in one area of Mexico in the Yucatan Peninsula. So in the highland rainforests in Mexico, that's where all monarch butterflies all over the world, that's where they reproduce. Now, tiger butterflies look like monarch butterflies, but they are indigenous, they're indigenous to North America as well, but they live in local wetland communities throughout North America. So they don't have this um, migration that the monarch butterflies do. And the interesting thing about monarch butterflies is their migration is intergenerational. So um, there'll be an, uh, you know, an, a, a young that uh, is born in the highlands of Mexico and then travels um, north in the summertime and then might find a mate in a wetland in a place like New Mexico and then lay its eggs and then the, um, and then the next generation does the next part of the journey and they migrate basically back from southern, the southern tips of Canada back and forth between there and Mexico um, through multiple generations. Um, now they eat milkweed, if you didn't know that, and that's a, that's a very nauseous plant that exists in wetlands. Um, so the deal is, is that these two butterflies, they, their ranges cross, but they have, they're totally different species. Now monarch butterflies are poisonous um, because to animals that would eat them um, of a certain body size because the milkweed is a neurotoxin. Um, and the tiger butterfly itself is also nauseous and poisonous. Um, it has enzymes that can um, dissolve the stomach contents of things that would eat it. Um, and it could actually chew its way out of the stomachs of animals that that would, that would consume it. So they're both virulent, but they have different ways that they're virulent. So because they have different life history strategies, um, they, will, they, they cross the same territory and they occupy the same spaces, but they don't live the same lifestyle. So the types of organisms that would have experiences with them are not the same. Um, but animals that have had negative experiences with either of these organisms will associate the, you know, the harmful enzymes of the tiger butterfly with a monarch or the neurotoxin of the monarch with a tiger butterfly, right? So they, so they have um, protective capacity with each other. So these are two organisms that both have virulent properties, but they're not necessarily the same type of virulence. Um, and as a result, it increases the sample size of predators or potential predators that have had experience with one of the organisms. And as a result, it increases the amount of organisms that will avoid both of them. So it's this, um, um, it's this uh, you know, combined protective capacity. Um, so this is a good example of convergent evolution, where they've evolved to look like each other to solve a common problem. Um, and that's malaria mimicry. So both of them have harmful properties, but they're not the same harmful properties. Okay, um, the next big ecological relationship is symbiosis, and I have this on the board, on my board here, you can say Hyaskina. Um, so these main ecological relationships are mutualism, commensalism, 
parasitism and the ultimate form of parasitism is predation. Right? Um, so mutualism is a relationship where two organisms, um, they have a relationship that is mutually beneficial to both. So they bring something that's positive to the table and it increases survivorship of both species. Right? Um, conventionalism is a relationship where one organism benefits and another organism is neither harmed nor um, nor ben um, is neither harmed nor um, uh, nor benefits from the situation. They're just kind of neutral. That's a very rare type of relationship that exists in natural ecosystems, because behavior typically typically is not frivolous. But there are some examples. It's a very rare type of behavior. A lot of types of commensalism that we initially thought were commensalism are actually mutualism. And parasitism is where one organism exploits the resources of another, but it doesn't necessarily kill the other organism. So, you know, common parasites like tapeworms and, uh, you know, Giardia protists and things like that. Viruses, bacteria. It's in their best interest to be able to take what they need, but not necessarily destroy the organism in the process. Because if they do, then they destroy their modes of transportation and survival. And predation is the ultimate form of parasitism, right? Where you actually consume the resources of another organism by killing it. Okay. So you, you, on a test, you could actually just see this. This is a really easy numerical response question where you have a couple examples and then you just associate the multiple, I mean, the addition and subtraction signs as positive and negative. Okay. So I'll give you some examples from my notes. And there's lots of examples of symbiosis. Lichens are a great example. Um, and we're still learning lots about lichens. We actually just discovered last year that it's two funguses plus an algae. For the longest time we thought it was just one fungus and an algae, but lichens are three organisms. And fungus, the fungus portion Right, so you're going to see those on all of our trees around here. And um, this is what caribou eat, by the way. They eat exclusively lichen, and they eat very specific lichen. Um, and this is why a lot of our woodland caribou in Alberta are in trouble, um, because their food source is being removed at accelerated rates. Um, lichen are environmental indicators, so that's why that's where litmus paper comes from. Litmus comes from lichen. Um, and in areas where acid precipitation is a big deal, a lot of the lichen that woodland caribou eat are disappearing. So our largest population of woodland caribou is actually up in Wood Buffalo in northeastern Alberta, which is the site of where the whale sands are. And the emissions cause a lot of acid precipitation. Um, so the lichen is disappearing. And we've also created a lot of survey cut lines in the forest, and wolves actually use those as transportation. So caribou are very predictable behavior. They, they hit the same places every day to feed and the wolves have figured that out. So they actually use the surveyor lines and they use it as a sort of a highway to go between these areas where the caribou, um, where the caribou feed and they've been able to just decimate caribou populations. Um, but anyway, so that's a form of predation obviously. Um, but uh, mutualism is where these two benefit. So the, the, the fungus provides the nutrients <coughs> and the substrate for the organisms to grow on, and the algae photosynthesize. And they provide sugar and ATP as a result. So this is commensalism. Um, we thought that this was, I should, I should paraphrase this actually. Um, we thought this was commensalism. So this is a lemon shark and these are remoras. Um, so whenever you've, if you've seen sharks in the wild or you've seen a nature video, then you know that these fish always hang out around sharks. Um, we didn't really know what the remoras did for a long period of time, but we knew that the shark gave the remoras protective capabilities or protective capacity, right? There's not going to be many things that attack a shark in order to get to the remoras. Um, but what we actually know is that these remoras are, are um, they're, they're bottom feeders, basically, and if and when they attach to sharks, what they actually do is is they um, consume parasites on the skin of the shark. So this actually increases the health of the shark. So these remoras actually clean the shark. So they, they, they take parasites and other types of things out of the gills. So we have peer-reviewed evidence that shows that 
sharks that have this relationship with remoras um, actually live longer, which is really, really interesting. So we thought that this was commensalism for the longest time because we didn't know what the benefit to the shark was, but now we do. So there's a really good example of commensalism in Alberta um, with wood bison, again in wood buffalo, and whiskey jacks. So you guys have probably seen whiskey jacks or heard them if you've been in the mountains in the summertime or in early spring. Um, they're also called gray jays. And um, the, the whiskey jacks, what they do in wood buffalo is they land on the horns and they land on the backs of the bison. And um, that keeps the animals, the, the birds from being preyed upon. And we're not sure, we don't really think that the buffalo get much of, uh, or the bison get much of um, um, an advantage from that. But it doesn't seem to harm them, so it doesn't, they don't really care. That's a tapeworm. Gross. Um, so obviously this is parasitism. So that's a negative... So, right, so the, the tapeworm benefits, right, and the, um, and the individual who's infected with the tapeworm uh, is obviously, their health is obviously, a, is, a, is compromised greatly, right? So, um, so that's a, you know, that, that's a net positive for one individual in the relationship and a net negative, right? You don't, you don't want a boyfriend or a girlfriend that's a parasite, right? So, um, anyway. So, right, so take a look at that. Um, tapeworms are gross. Tapeworms are essentially immortal. Um, so tapeworms are a segmented worm. And what they do is they clone their own parts. And there's not really a, an end or a beginning to them. So they clone their parts in these nodules. And what happens is they live in the guts of organisms and when the organism goes to the bathroom what they do is they shed these nodules and these nodules they can sit in soil for generations essentially so tapeworms are essentially immortal as well um, right so these guys they can hang out in soil and something consumes the soil right and then the tapeworm nodule ends up going through the guts um, of uh, of an animal or a human in some cases, right? Uh, there's been weird humans have used them for things like weight loss measures in the past. Really, really weird stuff. But anyway, that's parasitism. So those are your main um, ecological relationships. Um, you guys have seen this with Bio Twenty. Um, and then if you went to the Kananaskis Skill trip, you also studied succession, right? Um, one thing you should understand, right, is that succession is a model. And, right, so um, succession, there's two big things that happen, right? So it's the gradual change in plant vegetation and ecosystem over time. But it's generally a model. It doesn't always happen that way because there's always different levels of disturbance in an environment. And you could have natural disturbance. Um, you know, like a mudslide, which will remove the, you know, the climax community, community of trees. And then, you know, the shrubbery has to regrow. Um, or it could be um, anthropogenic, right? From, you know, like a farmer's field that's gone fallow. Um, and then the natural vegetation grows back and things like that. So in an intact ecosystem, there's always all sorts of different types of levels of succe succession happening. And remember that this is a model as, as well, because this is this is not what our what a, you know a climax community looks like in Alberta. Uh, we have coniferous trees; that's the largest organisms. But in general, what you see with succession in plants is an increase in biomass, so the amount of weight tied up in dry organisms, and in general, an increase in biodiversity. But the biodiversity actually dips a little bit once we hit the climax community because of light competition. So these large plants will shade out the understory. So the greatest part, the greatest segment of biodiversity actually exists in the transition from um, pioneer organisms to climax community. Right, so primary, so there's two types, right? Primary and secondary. So primary succession is where there was previously no plant community present. 
and it involves a, a pioneer plant species that can grow a soil base where there was previously no soil base. So think about like after a volcanic eruption or on barren rock on an island or something like that. Uh, maybe a large flood which scoured the, um, which scoured the uh, humus layer of soil. You need um, uh, something that, can, that doesn't need a root structure like a, a, a moss or, or a lichen or a fungus and then it can break up the, the bedrock slowly and then build a soil base as it dies and decomposes. And then you'll, and then you'll eventually hit the climax community, which is um, the stable, greatest amount of biomass. So primary succession is pretty uncommon because you, know, you think about things like volcanic eruptions, they're generally not that common. Uh, but you could think about primary succession happening as well from, you know, let's say an old parking lot that um, was decommissioned and then the plants grow back, right? There was no soil layer there and um, that's what's happening. So there's been like an urban agriculture revolution in um, areas that are uh, land scarce over the last few years and um, they're using, you know, like old parking lots and things like that to plant agricultural crops. But this is the most common type of succession, secondary succession. So there's already a soil layer and um, there's a disturbance that happens and you know things like fire are a disturbance it's a natural part of an ecosystem um, our forest fires are quite a bit stronger than they used to be because of fire suppression and because of climate change today um, but then the plant community grows back right so after a disturbance you know these natural um, purging events will rebuild the ecosystem after as um, you know pollinated plant species recolonize Okay, so almost done here. Um, growth pyramids. There's three types of growth pyramids that you can see in different um, populations. I mean, we're gonna use the human population as an example. You get a rapid, slow, or negative growth. So these are different countries that have different types of growth rates. So developing nations have really, really high fertility rates. And what you see with rapid growth is that most of the population is young. So you can see the percent of population here, and then the age on the y-axis. Um, in developed economies, you have, you have growth, but slow growth. And this is ideally what you want for a nation, is you want the bulk of your population to be of working age, because they're the most productive members of society. They're the individuals that are contributing the most to GDP. And then this is negative growth. So a lot of our developed European nations, um, they have an aging population and they're not having as many children. Um, and as a result, the, there's a very large tax burden to be able to support an older population. So these population pyramids are really important for public policy. Um, you know, like looking at an aging population like Germany, um, they're trying to stimulate young couples to have children and they have um, you know, incentives like uh, paid daycare and free school and um, uh, you know, a stipend um, for families to have children and things like that. Um, so these growth pyramids are really important for public policy. The interesting thing about the US, even though it's a developed country, it still has a relatively high infant mortality rate and birth rate and that's because of the disparity between the richest and the poorest individuals in the United States. Um, there's a large portion of the population in the United States that is very very poor and uneducated so um, the distribution of wealth is or um, lack of distribution of wealth is very extreme in that country and only getting worse. Um, anyway that is the end of ecology. It's a quick lecture. Um, Think about all these things for your poaching assignment as well, because a lot of these relationships are relevant. Um, if you have questions, uh, please fire me that on the D2L pager. And that's it for ecology. That'll be my last lecture until after spring break, and we'll be starting with um, genetics after that. Um, anyway, uh, have a good one. We'll talk to you later.